first session after lunch today. We have Mr. Sajay Singh, partner of J. Shagar Associates, who will be speaking on artificial intelligence, risk challenges, competencies, and strategy. Sa uh, Sajay is a past president of ITEC Law. This is a first for any in Asian country. Sajay has been with JSA for over 27 years and undertakes transactional work with a focus on representing emerging technology companies in areas of inbound investment in India. During his career, he represented technology clients focused in a cross section, in, in a cross -section of industries including defense, banking and finance, hospitality, automotives, retail and communication. This clients, his client, these clients include established and high technology companies, internet startups, connectivity specialists, e-commerce ventures, IoT, AI, connected technology and technology based entertainment industries. He leads the firm's technology licensing practice as well as firm's knowledge based industry practice. Sajay's work requires him to actively work with offices of various regulators. So, Mr. Sajay, we welcome you on stage. Various uh, speakers, the list of speakers and presenters, and I realize that you've already had a lot of, uh, uh, you've already had two speeches on legal issues uh, relating to artificial intelligence. And also, this is probably the last, the end of your two-day conference. So, you've learned everything there is to learn about artificial intelligence. So I don't think I'm going to tell you anything new. Think of it as a summary of whatever you've learned. What I'm going to try and bring out, hopefully this, these are issues that you've already discussed, but what I will try and bring out are some of the challenges that uh, artificial intelligence poses, and you can call them bots, you can call them robots, whatever you want to call it. But artificial intelligence and the beings they create pose when they are introduced into society. And basically, when they're introduced into society, they are also, um, you need to have laws that govern them, laws that control them, laws that probably give them rights. So this is the uh, area that I will be talking about and the risks that, have, that are there and, and the challenges that will be there to write law uh, to govern artificial intelligence. So with that, uh, thank you, thank you, I needed that. Um, with that, I will move on. Let's just, as lawyers or um, as any uh, one who's starting to write anything about or write law, the first thing you need is a definition. So what is artificial intelligence? Probably said many times throughout this conference, but I will give it my own spin. Artificial is something that is man-made. It doesn't appear out of nature. Intelligence is the whole ability to acquire no and apply knowledge and skills. Um, it's um, the thing to remember here is that, uh, and I'll use these concepts uh, repeatedly. So, intelligence also has a very important, a few very important elements. Reasoning. With intelligence, we can reason. With intelligence, we can learn. We can improve ourselves. And finally, we've spoken a lot about decision-making that artificial intelligence does. I'm going to talk about another human characteristics, a characteristic which is associated with intelligence, which is judgment. So we sit on judgment. We have judges also who uh, adjudicate, but most of us take, make an assumption or create a judgment based on a situation. So let's just look at artificial intelligence down the ages. Artificial intelligence was first referenced in Homer's Iliad. That was probably the first sort of reference to uh, artificial intelligence. And since then, um, Star Wars and Star Trek with uh, these characters have made artificial intelligence a part of our day-to-day -day life, at least in our folklore. It's touched every aspect of life and continues to touch different aspects of life. But what is it that is that distinguishes a human being from artificial intelligence? 
a very simple thing, common sense. And that's where the bridging of the gap between um, man and machine hasn't happened, where the machine starts uh, understanding or having, or getting common sense. And common sense is really an application of context. When you hear someone speak, based on, a, on your knowledge, based on the environment, you take in everything, you contextualize it, and then you either take a decision or speak or whatever you have to do. So this is something, this is an ability that human beings have which is, um, which we take for granted, uh, and it's very difficult as of now to codify. There is some talk that in the year 2041, there will this uh, sort of uh, merge or that this bridge will be formed and thereafter the machine may also get something akin to common sense. So uh, in terms of um, artificial intelligence, uh, I'll just sort of run through um, the pros and cons, I think all of these are things that you're very well aware and you probably heard a lot. Um, the pros, of course, are that artificial intelligence being a machine does not get exhausted like a human being. So we don't have, the, there's no tiring. So the work can keep going on and on and on. You don't take, need to take a coffee or a networking break, which we'll have after the session. You don't need to. You didn't need to have a lunch break. You didn't need to feed your bodies. It just keeps going on and on and on. So just imagine the power of that tool, which just doesn't need a break. On the con side, like with every other machine, the biggest con or the biggest danger is something going wrong or failure happening. You are being operated upon by a robo in a hospital and something goes wrong. It just cuts you further. So. It's, it's that one issue that sort of is the highlighted one, but there could be several other issues. Um, uh, data loss could happen. Uh, artificial intelligence acts without morals or ethics, which we associate a lot with human beings. And therefore, a lot of decisions that people take will be very different. Of course, you can, the flip side of that is that they will be all rational, all, subje uh, all objective decisions with no ob subjectivity. However, there is some benefit in having ethics, morals in the human being uh, and empathy. Also, the thing to remember is with artificial intelligence, um, the whole issue of um, creativity is probably going to be lost. So you cannot at least for the time being, you cannot imagine an artificial intelligence or a robo doing a painting. So the paintings that you find, they could copy paintings, they could change colors of existing paintings, but to create an artistic work may be a challenge for artificial intelligence. So these are some pros and cons. Now, being a lawyer, and since I need to talk about um, artificial intelligence uh, and laws relating to that, let's Look at the first laws. In 1940 was the first sort of codification of law on artificial intelligence. It wasn't by a government, it wasn't by a multilateral agency, but by an author. Isaac Asimov's uh, three uh, laws of robotics. You probably have already heard of these before, uh, but they're very, very simple. A uh, robo will not injure a human through inaction or allow a human to come to harm. That's the first law. Second, a robo must o obey the object or orders given to it by human beings, so it is uh, subservient to a human being. Uh, unless uh, such orders are in conflict with the first law, which is causing harm to humans. And the third is a robo must protect its existence so long as it doesn't uh, conflict with the law one and two. These laws were written, as I said, in 1940. That was soon after we had a lot, we had uh, a, the whole uh, world went through a lot of upheaval. There were wars all across the globe. Societies uh, sort of went through a whole period of 
um, uh, lack of economic resources, and the only economic, uh, only funding that came, came from um, uh, the, the military. And therefore, we had David Langford's extensions of uh, Asminov's laws, which are the fourth, fifth, and sixth law, all of them based on the fact that funding was coming from the uh, military. And here, it, the robo, here the fourth law said the robo will not harm authorized government personnel, uh, but will terminate in, in, in intruders with extreme prejudice. A robo will obey the orders of authorized personnel, and of, of course, if it, uh, unless it conflicts with the third law, and it, a robo, because it's so expensive, will protect itself. Now, let's just, these were the laws that have been written by thinkers, by, uh, by authors. But if we were to write law, if the Indian government or the government of the United States or any country or the UN was to write laws, what would it write laws on? Or what would it write laws that will, um, what, what would be the fundamental issue? One is definition, which I'll come to later, but the most fundamental issue that um, is relevant when you write a law is that there has to be a person because you can write a law around a person. So what you do is every law is written that protects people or a person, gives the person rights and responsibilities. So you have, as all of you know, you have certain responsibilities to society, to the government, to various other uh, organizations. And if you follow all those responsibilities and you take care of whatever your duties are, you get certain rights. If you violate any of those responsibilities or violate someone else's uh, responsibilities, then you may be penalized. There's a penalty that comes. So that's a basic premise on which law is written. So here now we will need to consider whether a robo or an or a bot or somebody with artificial intelligence is a person or no? How much are they like us and how different are they? Now, while I've listed some points over here, we must, if I was to ask a question and take a poll that like they are taking polls over here, how many of you believe that uh, a robo is like a human being no one will believe that a robo is a human being. Or no one will believe a robo is a person. You all will say it's a machine or it's a software, it's a hardware, it's something else. So therefore, it's not a person. So I will ask you a question and maybe get you all to think, um, was there not a time that women were not considered a person? Women had no rights. Many parts of the world, I hope that's not the case today, but women were just considered property of the male. What about the time when we had slavery? Were slaves persons? Did they have any rights or were they property that was bought and sold? And think about something else. Think about, I'll give a flip. When you have a fetus in your tummy and the fetus is growing, at what point does it get rights? So therefore, if there's a pregnant woman and you cause harm to her and you kill the fetus, have you committed a murder or not? So it's all based on the trimester. So if in the third trimester, the person gets rights, then all we are saying is that this is an evolution process. Artificial intelligence is at one point today, and soon we'll move to a point where it will be maybe 2041, maybe whoever, whenever. It'll become similar to human beings, so it is on the verge of getting the knowledge which will give it rights and make it a person. But even in the third trimester, the person is not able to think. The even when the child is born, he is considered a minor till he reaches 18, 21, 25. No one gives him rights. 
He can't take a decision. His parents have to sign everywhere. So, can we say that this is the infancy of artificial intelligence and therefore it will become a person soon down the line? Then I'll give you another example, prosthetics, and I'll come to, uh, I'll explain prosthetics a little bit more. But look at, if you are thinking about a person and you say, there, there are so many people sitting here. Now, all of you believe that you are all full human beings. But maybe some of you have had a heart attack and you have a pacemaker in your heart. If we remove the pacemaker, you will die and you will be a dead body. So you are being kept alive by a machine. Maybe some people have had other in incidents where they've lost a limb and they may have an artificial limb. So just because you were a person, a human being, by successively, either accidents or for various other reasons, if you will keep losing various limbs and get artificial limbs, you don't lose your personality as a person. You still have the rights, you still have the powers and the responsibilities. So I, I'm just drawing your attention to these various possibilities that exist already in society where people are either considered persons or not. Also, just to give you, just to get you thinking a little bit more, a company is con considered a legal person. A company can own property. So can uh, a computer own property? Can a computer do all the things that a company can do? Have a bank account, trade? So something to think about. The other thing that we'll have to think about when we are writing law for uh, uh, artificial intelligence is whether the artificial intelligence is a tool of human beings or an agent. So remember, an agent applies his mind, does actions. A tool is just something that follows instructions, that helps the person whose tool it is. So we have to be very, very careful of this. Maybe some may say that it's moving from tool to agent and then will become a full person one day. So let's now talk about some challenges that are there uh, today as we speak in drafting law on artificial intelligence. The first is the technological challenges. Here, I've already explained to you, common sense is missing. Also, the second thing is context in terms of language is missing. So you, while you can have a conversation with an artificial intelligence or a robo, uh, it's difficult, like was explained in many of the presentations, it's difficult for the complete context to be understood by the artificial intelligence. And also, finally, AI can't redesign itself as of now. Sure. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just e even going down further. So language is, is a larger language. Language, if uh, Tamil will be spoken differently in different parts, even if you say that uh, Chennai is a part of one dialect where the same dialect is spoken, a nuance of uh, the same language, there will be smaller dialects in different, in maybe urban Chennai to... Uh, yeah, idiolects. So then we come to social challenges. Social challenges, I was talking about identity. I spoke about whether you are uh, considering the AI as a tool or an agent. All of these items will uh, are challenges that we have in terms of the social challenges that will come about when we introduce AI into our lives. As of now, we believe that white, uh, uh, blue collar jobs are going to be lost by introduction of AI. But soon, uh, I, I'm one of the people who may be affected, soon the first profession, which is already getting affected, at least in England and various other, Japan and various other parts of the world, the first profession that will have the maximum impact of our AI is the legal profession. 
And of course, then we go on to finance and various other uh, 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 professions. But white collar jobs may also be lost. Of course, the, there's a bullet in the middle, which is a very interesting bullet. I won't read through the whole s uh, slide because I've spoken about it. But the bar of information literacy and computer literacy is dramatically changing. I'm working with the International Labor Organization on the future of work. And today what we are, have, what we are seeing is that if people are not keeping up with the technology, this technology is moving so fast and jobs are being replaced by, say, computers or, or AI, that the expectation of the level of technology is huge that every human being needs to have. So information literacy and computer literacy are becoming big challenges. Now, my main slide, which hopefully you've got a background, and now all the slides that I talk about are regulating on how to draft regulations on AI. So the regulatory challenges. Um, I've already spoken about the fact whether AI is a person or no. But assume they are legal persons. We came to a consensus in this room that, okay, we'll give them some, some uh, status as a person. Something, not person, person, but add some, uh, something to person like a legal person or some kind of a person or artificial person or something. Okay, then we come to the point of writing laws. First issue is we need a definition of artificial intelligence. I spoke about it earlier. There is no definition that everyone can agree to. And if there is no definition that you can agree to, then how will you write law relating to that, uh, that particular uh, item or that particular body? Um, of course, artificial intelligence right now is similar to human beings, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the key, I would say, challenges to draft legislation are in the last bullet, which is liability and gap control problems. And what I'll divide artificial intelligence, in, in, how I'll divide it, it in, is into two phases. One, while it is being created, and two, while it is, when it has been created and released into society. So I'll call them ex ante phase, that is before the fact, and post, ex post phase, which is after the fact. So they are released into society. So let's talk about ex post, uh, the ex post argument. Now, when you write law, when any country writes law, the way that law is written is that you can foresee a problem, and that's how you write law to prevent that problem from happening, or if it happens, what's the solution? So this is what brings about the concept of liability. Um, so basically, if somebody causes harm to another person, liability comes to him. That's the way it, it happens. We consider a car to be a dangerous piece of equipment. So when a person buys a car, the liability of the car comes to the person, so therefore the person immediately buys insurance because if there's an accident, liability will go squarely on the owner. Of course, the driver and all will come to, but squarely on the owner. However, if there's a manufacturing defect in the car, the liability will be on the uh, manufacturer. Now, in terms of AI, um, the foreseeability of what AI can do and not do is missing. So therefore, we, the, the, the standards of liability that we as lawyers work on cannot be applied to them. Add to this the more, two more complexities on liability. We have a concept of strict liability. So that's the concept where you caused harm, but you had no intent to cause harm. So you are still liable. The other is vicarious liability, where you actually were, didn't cause any harm, no intention. Somebody else caused harm, but somehow you also are liable. So that's these concepts in the artificial intelligence are even more complex to enforce. Then the other issue is of control. 
which is which we which is a big problem with artificial intelligence. Um, control as we define it is when the artificial intelligence is outside the control of the human. It could be a local control issue. So the creator of the artificial intelligence creates some AI and the AI takes control of itself, goes outside the control of the programmer. The global control issue could be where AI is outside the control of human beings. That's what most movies are based on, where machines are running the world and human beings are now uh, reduced to um, appendages. Uh, both of these control problems uh, uh, pose a challenge in terms of how do you draft legislation because the person enforcing the law is the human and AI has gone outside the control of the human. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to draft law because of this uh, reason. Now the ex ante phase, which I guess a lot of you who are uh, in the field of technology will understand this uh, very good, very well, is the whole concept of creation of AI is very difficult for a regulator or a legislature to draft regulations on. Whenever a government, whenever a law is drafted, it's basically drafted where you know the process of creation. You know how a machine is created. You know how an act happens. And that's how you create the law on that basis. Here, we have the discreteness problem, diffuseness and opacity problem. So the discrete um, uh, problem is in terms of when you are writing code, is the code being written by one person or is it being written by different people? Are these different people living in India, are governed by Indian law or living all across the world? So which law will apply? How will you apply law to this group of coders? Then the diffuseness problem, which is similar, if it, it could be all over, the uh, people could be all over. The opacity problem where when you are writing code, you could have put in different codes into it or you could have used different codes and evolved them which could be a proprietary and self uh, uh, code that you created yourself. So it's not, again, going by the foreseeability and the predictability issue, the, even during the creation of artificial intelligence, the regulator has no idea how the artificial intelligence is being created, who is in control of the creation process, so therefore writing law becomes very difficult. I'll take the liability discussion a little further because this is something that you all must be reading in the newspaper and you know probably the most written about is the driverless car and that causes an accident and various hypotheticals which I'm sure you've seen YouTube videos also on but all of them bring us to the issue of liability. And the liability, as I mentioned, um, in the traditional world, it is easy to take an insurance. But here, who is liable and who is to take insurance is an issue. Because here we are taking the control of the car, which is the owner, you know, generally has the control of the car. Maybe he loans it to someone, gives it to a driver, gives it to someone. That's different. But generally, the owner owns the car and has control over the car. Here, the owner has no control over driving the car. Here, the car is moving totally on its own. Again. If there was a manufacturing defect, then you could hold the manufacturer liable. But if there was no manufacturing defect in the accident, then who is liable? Um, who should take insurance? Who will the insurance company give insurance for a driverless car? And what all will it cover? So again, there, there was a very good example given in the last presentation about looking at a picture and saying, giving a comment where there was a burning house and the person said how beautiful. 
So the AI said, how beautiful. It's similar over here in the situation where um, there's no fault. The AI figures out what is happening in front, but takes either a wrong decision or responds late or has to choose between two evils and chooses one which is less. So all of these situations cause a liability challenge or uh, to uh, determine who's liable becomes a huge challenge for legislation. Um, then, of course, we have the privacy and security of personal data, which is an issue. Till now, we have all thought of uh, personal data as being created by the human being. Now, there are two challenges here. One, the human being, with AI invading our lives so much that even a mirror in our bathroom may be intelligent, um, they are constantly seeing and collecting information which you don't even know is being collected. So it, all that private or personal information of yours is being stored God knows where in several databases and could be accessed by different people for legitimate reasons. So one, the creation of personal information and personal data is now the definition is changing. It's not me who's creating my data. It's not me who is controlling my data. Somebody else is con creating my data. Somebody else is controlling my data. OK, flip it. What if artificial intelligence itself, like the robo itself, is the creator of the personal data? We were talking about, do we give them rights? Will they have a right to protect their data? So. I, I think in terms of the challenges, um, let me just, um, then we have the other discussed, uh, highly discussed uh, issue in terms of is the super intelligence or artificial super intelligence as it's being called, um, will it really substitute the human workforce, blue collar, white collar, I spoke about a little while back, or will it really enhance or allow human beings to create other jobs? So there is there's a lot of theory on this. As I said, I've done a whole uh, paper for the ILO on this, uh, or hasn't finished. I'm working with ILO on this. But I think the fundamental issue here is that human society and laws are created based on scarcity. This, I think, Indians would understand best. Because here we are 1.3 billion people fighting for scarce resources. State, my state, and, uh, Karnat, uh, and Tamil Nadu fight over water, fight over the water of one river. The, and the water from that, precious water from that river was released into the sea because there's no storage facility I was reading in the newspaper today. So what I'm trying to, uh, say here is that we, our laws, our mind, our psyche is based on scarcity. We are worried tomorrow there will be no water. What do we do? We conserve, we hoard. That's how our laws are written. Laws were never written for abundance. And when you have abundance, when scarcity will not be there with artificial intelligence, how will laws be written? So that's a whole challenge because you may actually, when you say job loss, you may actually not need to work. Is that a job loss or is that a great life? Who knows? So what next? Um, I think it is, uh, artificial intelligence is a fascinating field. It is something that is already in our lives, and as we have learned through these two days, becoming more and more integral part of our lives, and some of it, we are not even aware that we already have it in our lives. Um, but artificial intelligence is not something to be fearful of. It is still created by human beings, and yes, there could be subjectivity, yes, there could be bias introduced in it by the creator, but it's still being created by us. And I think, to an extent, it's still a tool. It hasn't become an agent as of now. It may have become 
you know, it's a moot point of discussion. And it will remain that till we want it to remain. So, just picking up my last presenter's comment on uh, spell check and, you know, correction of sentences. Um, artificial intelligence can correct spellings and it can, it's a great tool to correct your language. But it cannot give you, it will not be able to understand the context and will not be able to give you, will not be, become an author and be able to write the novel. So it can definitely become, create, uh, clean up your writing and copy. So it can do, it can be a great proofreader, but it's still a partial proofreader because it cannot, it doesn't, logic and context is missing from it. So these were my points. I think I have uh, 30 seconds, in that, 27 seconds left, and I have also completed my presentation. So thank you all for listening through in the afternoon. And I'm open to questions if you have any. Otherwise, my email is here and happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. Uh, you know, some parts of the world where if somebody has, if somebody is challenged in terms of mathematical ability or some ability and their brain, you know, the neurons are not sort of working out right. So you can introduce a medical device, a chip or something which will allow the person to be wire the brain slightly differently. So the person's ability, today he cannot do a math mathematics sum. Tomorrow, with this, he'll be able to do it very well. Um, so my point really on that is, so that was on the brain and the human body, I already spoke about that, you know, you lose a limb and you get it, you get, so you could, you could lose a spleen and you could get an art artificial spleen and various other uh, knee and hip and various other things. So with the brain, now, if like this, all the functions of the brain, are slowly being put inside the body as artificial intelligence, could there be a point where you are not a human being? But because you were born a human being, you got all the rights and responsibilities and we will continue to believe you are a person and we will write laws for you. So my proposition was that here is somebody, just because he doesn't look like a human being, he looks like a computer, is that the reason you are not giving him rights and responsibilities? Can he go to a court and assert a right? Does he have a right of property? Can he have a bank account? Can he, I'm saying? No. Sorry? Persons of unsound mind. Exactly. Persons who are incapacitated, who had an accident and, uh, you know, lost their power to do anything. They're alive, but they are not... They're called, the, the senses are not there. All of these are situations where you can at least have a debate. I mean, no one has an answer. It's just a point of getting you all to think of what there could be or, or how you should try and think of the various possibilities and therefore, should we give some rights to artificial intelligence? It, it, it can... Sorry? So I, I think that's the progression it will uh, make. Um, at least Hollywood or movies have already sort of painted that future. So, and, and generally what Hollywood does or Bollywood does or, you know, Tollywood or whatever, is, is really putting across what is happening in society. We may not be able to articulate it as well as they do. Maybe some is futuristic, but it is getting there. So I believe it will move. Today it's a tool. It may already, some people believe it's an agent already. But I think it will move to becoming an agent. And then, you know, what the progression is, I, I'm not sure. It can change relationships within the families also. Sorry? The relationship between families. Because a yeah. lot of dependencies now keep the families together. Now if uh, robots can replace so many work, Relationships will, new things will come up. Absolutely. Even today, 
Uh, I think one of the, uh, in my project for ILO, one of the things, I'll just give you one of the findings that I had in the research I did in 80 countries around the world. Um, one of the things with artificial intelligence that is happening is that um, you are talking about the family. I'll give you a very um, different, the workplace example. I didn't go in the family. I did, it, did the whole experiment in the workplace. In the workplace, if you remember many years ago, you said, my, this is my work family. We are like a family. That is breaking down. Now what is happening is that people do not need to have any interaction with each other. The human interaction is missing. You say a smoke break, smoking is bad and I don't want anyone to smoke, but the smoke break, the lunch break, the coffee break were bonding opportunities. With those bonds, information was shared. With those bonds, deals were created. People got to know things about each other. Decisions were made. When you remove them, I'm not even talking about artificial intelligence. I'm just talking about society, human beings. When you remove those situations, those lunch breaks, those, all of that, that, that goes, that, that's the whole informal community. That goes out. Suddenly, life becomes very formal. There's no subtext. And therefore, a lot of, I was talking about context, a lot of the subtext is missing, and the breakdown of the office relationship is so severe that there was an example which I came across that this whole group, remember, you know, we used to, have, many people have retreats and parties once a month or once a year or something, Diwali, Christmas, something. At that party, all these people came and they had nothing to say to each other. They, had, they used to interact every day with each other, but on email. The first time they were seeing each other and they were just, they didn't know what to say to each other. And eventually somebody started, sent a text to someone and that's how they started communicating in the party, they were physically all there, but there was nothing, they couldn't approach each other, there was, the social skills were missing. So, family, yes, of course. Yes, privacy, that's a big issue, because, yes, exactly. So that's Sir, the only thing which uh, human beings are unable to do now is to implant consciousness into the robots. If they do it, then it becomes a really a physical person. Until we come to that stage, we can, in my view, we can take it only at a, as a, what you call inanimate object. That is the point. So it's a consciousness is a very, um, uh, while I understand your point, consciousness has to be defined. And the, the way that people have defined it is, because they can do, they've done, uh, I have data which shows every human ability they have, you know. Literally, they have everything. The only things that I've, I've already pointed out, things that are missing, I've pointed out, which is common sense. So in the sense of, um, uh, you know, any act or any function that a human being can do, they can do. There's um, nothing. Um, the, only, the things that they cannot reproduce, so they, that's the ability they don't have to reproduce. Human beings can. They cannot create another uh, or they cannot regenerate themselves or, you know, change themselves. So these are some things that are missing. But beyond that, at least, I mean, I don't know what consciousness would be, but every facility has been broken down and they have almost at every level AI is, can do that act. So, yes, I mean, what you call consciousness may be a, an uh, amalgamation of ethics, morals, principles, uh, context, common sense, all of that put together. Yeah. Now, coming to this uh, legal, yeah, legal okay. and regulatory issues. Now, we have always been contending with the change in the technology. I mean, there is nothing new today. Now, suppose, say, we have even mobile phones. Maybe mobile phone is bursting, you know, maybe because of some hardware software problem, or maybe an MRI equipment. Maybe the equipment has failed, or maybe there was a software bug which led to a wrong diagnosis. So like that, I would say that artificial intelligence also bring in an added dimension of technology in terms of maybe the hardware or the software part of it. So what do you think is the something in an added dimensions which is <coughs> cause for worry in the legal or regulatory issues? So, so long as it's an MRI equipment which is in a room and contained, and the doctor uses it 
and performs the MRI and shuts it, that is very different. Till then, it's a tool. The minute it moves into society where it can, it actually is working next to you, and one of the things I studied for ILO was the fact that if a robo and a human being work together, say on an assembly line, the challenges that come with that. And that's where I got the whole thing of getting exhausted. The human being gets tired. They don't get tired. So the same act can be done, you know, continuously. So my point was when artificial intelligence in that form, like we have a robo outside as well in one of the booths, in that form, or in any other form, when it is released into society, where it, it is interacting with human beings, rather than being merely a tool where you are ch checking some, that's when the challenges come, because it is in a situation that possibly it could cause harm to a human being, or a human being could cause harm to it. But all artificial intelligence need not necessarily be robots. No. Like they were talking about artificial intelligence. They were saying in healthcare, they were using artificial intelligence to treat those diabetic uh, rhinoplasty or whatever it is. Yes. There, I think. Uh, no. So long as it's problem. a tool, that's why I said so long as it's a tool which you are using, and that operative part is whether the human being is using it, that's fine. Because then, if something goes wrong, you know who's liable the person who decided to use it, or if there's a manufacturing defect, the manufacturer. So that's pretty much how it works. There is a law for it, which is coming, like the same way it is coming. So the law coming from December 1st, the drones policy of India, is it come under the AI policy or in which category we can class that regulation? So drones has, drones is a, um, drones are very specific and the government um, has very specific departments which get involved in that. Civil aviation, defense, strangely minist uh, agriculture ministry. So there's, there's several departments of the government that get involved and that's how the drone policy has been written. Mine was a broader discussion. Drones may be a part, they may have artificial intelligence of course, but mine was a more, uh, uh, I would say a broader discussion on AI being released into society and then the controls that there are around it, the rights and responsibilities that are around it, uh, how would that work? And that's where I came, I was coming from. Question. <laughs> Scary question. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a very scary question. <laughs> I don't want the answers of that. The results I want to destroy. Thank you very much.